I'd like to start this off by asking Steve what we're talking about rare earths. And was it 100,000 metric tons per year? Oh, I can, I, uh, I'd have to look back at the slide, but I mean, we need thousands and thousands of Thousands metric. and thousands of metric tons. Yeah, and it's mm -hmm. going to keep increasing. And the tie-in to this has to do with fission products, and they contain these rare earths. The, 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 the fact that, that th thorium is mined coincidentally with rare earths, okay. and we currently have a bottleneck here in the United States because of the thorium issue. And I just wanted to, people to understand and, and underscore the importance, both currently and in the future, of rare earth elements in general. I'm going to talk about how one throws away rare earths. They may be very valuable, <laughs> but they do represent something like a third mass-wise of the fission products that are created by almost any kind of nuclear reactor involving fission. It may be possible to find a customer for these things. I suspect as much as we're mining out of the ground or will be mining out of the ground, that the recycling of fission products, certainly this kind of fission products, will be probably hard to sell. If we implement any sort of truly sustainable nuclear fuel cycle, we are going to have to reprocess stuff. Maybe that's not the correct word. We'll have to clean up the waste, the uh, fuel salt stream, one way or the other. And uh, that will involve uh, chemistry. And there will be chemicals, waste produced, and a good deal of it. Depending on how one implements the fuel cycle, it can be a tremendous amount. And this is one of the uh, legacies of the way the nuclear power came to be, and it's especially troublesome in this country. It's troublesome in Russia, too, but they don't get quite as hyper about things as we do. One of the issues uh, that nuclear power has is, and it's always brought up in, when you get people talking about, well, should we do this, is the waste thing. And DOE admits right now its projected cost for cleaning up its own reprocessing waste at its own facilities now, something like $200 billion. Now, wouldn't it be nice to have a couple percent of that to spend developing a whole new nuclear fuel cycle that doesn't create this kind of waste? Okay, it would be nice. But one way or the other, we are going to have to clean up after ourselves. And if we are going to be accepted in this future world, we're going to have to show up front that we have addressed it already, we know how to do it. And we know how to do it in a way that is acceptable. That is, a decision maker at this point is not going to criticize you because you decided to make some mineral out of it that you can't make. Okay, why well, commit to a waste one? That is, once you have the waste, you need to be able to make something into it, which is a waste form. A waste form is understood to be something that if you dispose of it, put it in a hole in the ground, it's not going to dissolve if groundwater happens to break into this thing. It shouldn't be a powder. It shouldn't be a liquid. It shouldn't be readily dispersible. It should be something people feel comfortable if, if Necessity says that we never have a, a uh, Yucca Mountain. You could still leave it wherever you generate it, basically. It's got to be tough stuff. Wind can't blow it around, and water can't dissolve it. And we need to commit to it. So I referred to the $200 billion legacy we're facing right now. It, is a, it probably will not be completed. I, I just can't see us, this country, the way it is right now, spending $200 billion on the kind of waste that's been generated in the past. But we do need to commit, and it's one of the things that's been holding us back. Incidentally, that's a heck of a good book, Atomic Awakenings. My assumptions are here that waste and mobilization will be a part of the system. Whatever it is we get behind and say we're gonna do, we're gonna tell everybody we're gonna handle the waste right up front. That's what the Europeans do with their modern reprocessing facilities. They go clear to waste forms. They don't, when they dissolve the fuel, within a few days, they've got a waste form already there. They've made glass out of it. It will be completed not 40 years down the future, you know, 30 years away. It's going to be completed quite soon. Once the stuff comes out of the reactor, we're not waiting till, you know, for our grandchildren to do it. It's got to be done in real time, almost real time, within five years after removal of the reactor. And that's fine because then you're getting down to the 30-year half-life stuff is determining that the initial burst of fission product heat is over with. Five years is a reasonable time. 
your disposal for, uh, form must meet stakeholder expectations. Again, wind can't blow it around, and if water gets to it, wherever you put it, it's not going to dissolve. No great leaps of faith. Okay, if we're going to convince people we are going to do this, we can't assume that there's going to be breakthroughs that people have been looking at for 30 years and haven't made yet. It's got to be a technology, this waste treatment, two waste forms has got to be something that we can do now if we, want, if we had the waste. And disposal forms, of course, are going to stay in situ for some time. That's why you want a good one. If it never goes anywhere, no tragedy. Uh, characteristics. Product's got to be a good quality product, can't be too big, uh, it's got to be durable. The process doesn't want to generate a whole bunch of secondary waste streams that are worse than or harder to get rid of, more expensive than the initial one. You want, and the key to that is recycle. Recycle any chemical that you use in your process. Now in lifters, based on fluoride, that chemical would be fluoride. That's the key to this. If you want to make this work, recycle has to be a part of the system. It's something that DOE has totally ignored. Okay, IFR. There's two ways of implementing it. We're here to talk about the other one. But IFR has got a big head start on us. And basically, there's two kinds of waste generated. One is a salt waste. We would generate a salt waste with lifters, too. It's just that we would probably have a fluoride-based salt waste. The IFR uses a chloride-based salt waste. Again, it's a molten salt. Their reprocessing involves a molten salt, and it's chloride-based salts. And the waste that they're going to throw away, the actual stuff that's in the uh, cans of waste, that's high-level waste that's to be thrown away, if you look at it, it's 95 mole percent alkali metals, mostly lithium and potassium. Has some sodium, has some cesium, but it's mostly uh, alkali metals, not fission products. This is as concentrated as the waste ever gets, and it's 95% other stuff already. The point I'm trying to get across here is this disposal problem is an alkali disposal problem with 5% fission products thrown in on with it. So your waste form has to be able to handle alkalis, lifter waste. If you have thermal, epithermal reactors, like they will probably be moderated in some way or another, then the salt will be a fluoride salt, FLIVE, probably. But the waste will be a mixture of fluoride salts. And if we implement a fast reactor for one reason or another, it would be chloride salts. The waste streams would be very similar to those for your uh, IFR. But they're salts. OK, the basis lifter waste stream, this is the basis I use because it's, it's where I, <laughs> source where I could get definite numbers for how much is apt to be produced by a gigawatt's worth of electricity production over a year. About four tons of sodium and uh, magnesium fluoride pellets containing some fission products, mostly as fluorides. You're going to have four tons of that stuff. And it's mostly sodium fluoride. Then you're going to have one ton each of lithium fluoride plus Involatile fluorides. This is from a distillation process. You generate this separate, you have a separation so that you can put the salt back, the useful salt back into the reactor. You're getting a ton of this stuff. And then you get aqueous waste. And the aqueous waste turns out to be mostly potassium fluoride. That's what it'll actually be. It's from a scrubbing solution which absorbs HF, makes potassium fluoride. So your waste is, again, 95 mole percent alkali metals in this case, as fluorides. That's what your waste actually would be. And, uh, well, you got to make a rock out of it, something that's durable, something that doesn't blow around on you. Glass is what you want to make. And the process to make glass is called vitrification. Anyhow, when folks talk about disposing of halide-based waste, okay, when they think chloride, they think, ah, sodalite, because out there in Mother Nature has made a mineral which contains some chloride, which is relatively insoluble. And sodalite jumps into their mind, so that's what they base their waste form on. That's what DOE did. Folks developing the IFR, liquid metal fast breeder reactor system, their whole waste form uh, development program was based around the assumption they're going to make sodalite. In the case of fluoride based salts, the first thing that comes to mind apparently, it's come to mind several times, is to make this crystalline mineral called fluorapatite. 
Nice mineral, the problem is it's 3.7 weight percent fluoride and much less than that weight percent of other stuff. When you look at the overall, if by the time you ended up making this stuff, your waste form would be contain less than, less than a half weight percent fission products. So you'd have to make 200 tons of stuff to get rid of one ton of fission products. Very dilute. They can't contain much of what you're trying to throw in away. So they, the uh, ceramic waste forms, where you're trying to make a crystalline waste form, don't contain much waste. Uh, and glasses, glasses are basically a solvent. You, you create an insoluble matrix and you can put stuff into it. You can put just about anything into it. Up to maybe 20, 30 weight percent of stuff can go into a glass and it's still a glass. The only way that stuff can get out is if the glass itself dissolves. So you have to dissolve the glass to get the stuff out. Okay, and what dissolves most easily in a glass? Made of alkali? Alkali. So it's really the making of a waste form, a waste like this, the goal is to keep alkali from leaving because if the alkali leaves, then other things, the stuff, you know, the plums that are in the pudding will also get out. If the alkali doesn't leave, then everything's good. The fission products are in it. So what we're trying to do is, is immobilize alkali some way, and glasses do a fine job of that, if you do it right. And they're very simple to make. All you do is throw stuff in a pot and melt it. You're not trying to create conditions where a specific mineral is formed. You're throwing stuff in a pot and melting. That's what vitrification is. It is pretty simple, really simple. Okay, to make all this work, the halide. You know, there's no reason to throw away a halide, and that's certainly not anything as expensive as a high-level waste form. Okay, because they're not, particu not particularly toxic. If, if they're there as ions, they're not toxic at all. Fluoridine, you put on your teeth, you eat it as, as salt. It's easy to make it, uh, convert fluorine and chlorine to those forms. They're not toxic. In terms of, are they radioactive? They're not radioactive. So why spend a million dollars per cubic meter throwing away fluoride, especially when you're using it in the process. Okay, so recycle the stuff. There's lots of reasons for doing it. There's glasses, you're gonna make glass. There's three different kinds of glasses out there. There's the borosilicate glass that DOE has focused on an awful lot. Some cases make sense, other cases makes less sense. Our Russia focused on aluminophosphate glass for the same ways, but Tremendous amounts of both of those glasses have been made. And most, most recently in the dough complex, because of an admission by DOE that maybe borosilicate doesn't work very well for some of DOE's problems, they've been studying iron phosphate glasses. And there's good reasons to study them. FEP, that's iron phosphate glass. It's a better choice than borosilicate. Easier, simple, cheaper to make. And the reason is because phosphoric acid is a fairly strong acid. It's not like silica. Phosphoric acid is a strong acid. So if you put a chloride salt in with phosphoric acid, the chloride comes out. Recycle is dead easy with it. The waste form making process does your separation for you. And the separation comes off as HF, or well, in the case of chloride, HCl. HCl is an acidic gas. It's easy to scrub. It's easy to recycle. Put it back into your process. This is how I do stuff. It's the way I, uh, you can't get funding to do research. I'm ex-DOE. If I were DOE, they still wouldn't fund me. So I do it at home. Based, and the drivers are quite different. Okay, I'm, not, I'm not trying to just spend the money. I'm trying to solve the problem. Okay, so we made about 50 glasses all together, both direct and indirect. Direct meaning you throw the stuff in the pot, melt it up, and that's your product. Indirect means you do something to it before you throw the stuff in the pot and melt it up and make it. That means, indirect means I've done a halide separation up front. Specimens were tested by DOE's own leach protocol. You grind this product into fine particles. You put it in boiling water for a week and you determine what's in the water. And you compare it to DOE's own standard for their high-level waste glass. That's what a glass looks like. So it's stuff in the center of my uh, mortar. Okay, and it's a, that's a glass. There's a crucible it was made of. I won't show you the. Don't have enough time to show you the furnace it was made of. 
This is what the direct, direct mean, vent means, everything thrown in the pot. And on the left-hand side, we have iron phosphate, sodium fluoride. The other ingredients for the iron phosphate glass are phosphoric acid and iron oxide. Put in that, you melt it up, and you can see it's not very shiny. Okay, if you do the same thing with chloride, sodium chloride as opposed to sodium fluoride, you get this nice, lovely, shiny glass. You see, that looks more like a glass. And for comparison side, we've got some melted EA glass, the borosilicate glass, also containing iron. The two on the right are true glasses. The one over there is a mixture of glass and a ceramic, well, actually a crystalline material. Okay? But that's what they look like. And these two are glasses, and that's a glass ceramic over there. Characterization, okay, well, you look at it, it tells you a bunch. Is it clear or is it not clear? Okay, is it shiny or is it not shiny? Mass, okay, you weigh everything going in, you weigh what's coming out. Does it agree with what you would like it to? That is, the assumptions, are you driving off all the halide? Because you can tell that. Halide comes off, it has to be replaced by something else which weighs something else. So it's either meets expectations or it doesn't. And then, of course, the leach test. Grind it up, put it in hot water, and see what, how much stuff is in the water. And that's very easily done. I said, this is all about retaining alkali metals. And when alkali metals dissolve out of a glass and go into water, they create a salt solution. The conductivity, electrical conductivity of a salt solution tells you how much salt's in it. And that's why I'm able to do this stuff at home. And you can compare it to the same thing that you get with the EA glass that you purchased from the OE. Okay, chloride salt-based waste. I got this stuff published, stuff I did in my basement, uh, right down there. In fact, it's coming out this month. It's June issue of Nuclear Technology. It has my paper in here. And this one addresses the chloride waste. That would be a fast lifter or IFR waste. And uh, it's very easy to do this stuff because all you have to do is throw everything in a pot the HCl comes out, there's no prior separation involved, you get a nice glass, and the glass is better than DOE standard. Very simple to do. Fluoride-based salt waste, the direct process creates a glass that has crystals in it, crystals containing leachable fluoride. And it turns out that's not a good product, because you can come up with a scenario that's realistic, if you put this stuff in the ground, water gets to it, the water's moving, it's going to dissolve pretty quickly. The bottom line is you have to separate the bulk of the fluoride before you make a glass if you're going to throw away this stuff. But it turns out it's easy to do. But the fact is, is that it, the direct process doesn't work very well. Nitric acid increases vapor pressure. Uh, I've done it quite a number of times. Most important is this process, adding nitric acid, driving off the HCl. It's easy, or HF. It's easy to recycle the fluoride, and it's easy to destroy the NOx because NOx is so reactive, as is nitric acid, that you can convert it to nitrogen chemically, very simply, very cheaply. So it doesn't create an incidental waste. And it's cheap to do. That's how I did it. This is large scale. <laughs> My small scale ones were much smaller than this, but this is a frying pan, an aluminum frying pan with Teflon on it. You put uh, sodium fluoride in it, you add nitric acid to it, heat it up, and boom, you've done your separation. Even DOE could do this for less than a billion dollars. <laughs> okay. These, these are what the products look like. Again, on that side over there is the direct one containing the, the, uh, the crystals of water-soluble stuff. Over here is the true glass, which is, has very good leach properties. Leach test results. Over there on that axis, we have the fraction of alkali which leaches in at the end of, well, whatever period of time we've got here on the bottom. For the PCT test, DOE's standard test, that's seven days at 90 degrees and so forth. Their glass, the reference, about 16% by this test goes into solution. 16% of DOE's glass has dissolved in that time, releasing its alkali into the water. These glasses that you create this way are about eight times better than that. It's very simple, and it's very cheap. We can do this. Uh, Off-gas treatment, we, we, stuff comes out of the pot when you do these boil downs and when you make glass. What you want to do is filter them out of the air and you want to uh, uh, capture the fluoride and you want to capture any particulate matter that comes out and any volatile 
fission products. You trap them and you destroy the NOx. So Three things. You want to capture the fluoride so it can be recycled. You want to destroy the NOx and you capture the fission products. Okay, and the way to do it is with hot carbon. This is a reactor. The gas comes in the bottom containing uh, uh, nitric acid and HF, NOx, fission products, and steam. Because remember, we're, this is water, nitric acid, HF. So these, ga these gases are going to be coming out of that thing. If you react them with carbon at about 500 degrees, the carbon will quantitatively reduce everything to nitrogen. All the oxidized nitrogen species will go to nitrogen gas. But the fission products, these are metal fluorides for the most part, are reduced right down to metals. And the metals are not volatile. They stick to the carbon. And they will stay in there until the carbon's burned up. When the carbon particles get small enough, they blow out and you can capture them in a downstream cyclone filter. So the fission products will be capturable. A small amount will be mixed up with graphite and is a fine dust, a small waste stream. This is a system where salts go in the one side, recycled water goes in this side, fluorides are taken out the bottom, converted to sodium fluoride, one of the main reagents used in the process, or to fliber, whatever it is you want, and they can be recycled, and then the fission products all end up in glass. Yeah, there's several ways to deal with this carbon fission product mess, but probably the, the best one is take this stuff, burn off the residual carbon on it, and put it back into the melter. If you've got a, an efficient recycle loop, you can even get technetium and iodine to stick in glass quite efficiently. And the folks at Catholic State University proved that. Summary, we can't keep kicking this waste can down the road. We certainly don't want to start off trying to sell people on lifters unless we've got an answer for the waste question. And I think we have an answer. It's pretty easy to vitrify this stuff if you're willing to recycle. And we should want to do that anyhow. Vitrification, if you suggest we're gonna do anything but turn it into glass, everybody's gonna raise their hackles because vitrification is what the world does with high level waste. So we can do it too. Halide recycle makes it practical and using the assumptions that, uh, from that Oak Ridge paper uh, about the amounts of salts and the types that were created, we're talking about a gigawatt years worth of electricity generating a 6.5 cubic meter, 6.5 cubic meters worth of glass, which would be a little bigger than this if this were a cube, but not much bigger than this. So a big reactor running for a year generates a waste form a little bigger than that thing is. And it's, it turns out to be about the same amount if you're running an IFR. Um, in the UK, there is a vitrification plant in Sellafield. Do you happen to know whether it matches your high standards in your basement. Well, borosilicate glass, and they're making, out of, they're making a borosilicate glass out of the waste generated by a Purex plant. The facility itself, the melter, would be essentially the same, except that you're feeding it rather than with boric acid and silica, you'd be feeding it with phosphoric acid and, and uh, iron oxide. But no, it's, it's quite simple and straightforward. Instead of recycling, as they do, nitric acid, we would be recycling hydro hydrofluoric acid. But it's pretty straightforward. Now, uh, thank you again, Daryl. That was fantastic. <laughs>